Well, I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Tried to, tried to pick some Father's Day songs today that remember that God is our Father. Well, I was going to put together a Father's Day message. But that's very, very difficult. Because Father's Day can be a difficult time for a lot of us. Uh, um, my father is gone. Uh, my earthly father. My heavenly father's always there. And you know, he's the, one, he's the one that's the model for all fathers. I feel a little intimidated on Father's Day because I, I know that I'm frail and weak and I haven't been the best father in the world as God has been to me. And uh, so I, I, I feel like, yay, you know, <laughs> let's, let's get to, to the next thing, you know, next day or whatever. And let's talk about God our Father. Amen? Amen? Because he's the one who's always there. He's the one who protects. He's the one who provides. He is the way, the truth, and the life. <coughs> and he's worth singing about and, and lifting up. Pray with me. Father, this morning we come before you, our Heavenly Father, and we thank you for the way that you have opened our eyes and helped us to understand who you are, that you sent your Son into the world and that you have revealed him to us for our benefit, that you as a loving Father loved us so much that you sent your Son to die for us. I don't understand that, and yet I understand it's true. I pray that you help us, Lord, to receive this free gift, that you might help us to be renewed in our minds and our hearts and our spirits today, that those of us with challenges in our lives and difficulties that you only know, I pray that you would minister today by your word and by your Holy Spirit. You know, Lord, that we're weak and you call us vessels and yet we leak. So, Lord, I pray that you might fill us anew here today, that we might have a new perspective of who you are, that you might help us to have an appreciation for what we have in you. Lord, we give you this time in ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. I'm, I'm titling this A Fire in the Wilderness. And, of course, I'm speaking about John the Baptist. Chapter 3 begins with the story of John the Baptist. We've already seen how he came and he was born to Elizabeth and Zechariah, how he came while they were very, very old or were very stricken in years, old in years. In Luke 3.16, John answered and saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this is what John the Baptist said as he was coming and introducing Jesus, if you will. He was the forerunner for Jesus. So I just wanted to be a spoiler and let you know that might be what you get today for Father's Day. It's one of the more common things, although I, I don't think I've ever received a tie for Father's Day. But it seems to be, you know, something, well, he doesn't have one that looks like this. So we're going to go to the scriptures and read it through first in verse one of chapter three. It says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of our God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, 
that's how you win friends and influence people. <coughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I was thinking that'd be a great greeting for today as you walked in. <laughs> but I didn't do it. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized, said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. For as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, he shut up John in prison. And all the people were baptized. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed... The heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. So the life of John the Baptist. It's interesting how we're given the birth, and as Luke is writing here, being a very detailed historian, is giving us a chronological order of things. And then he kind of rushes ahead to the end and, and lets you know what happens with, with uh, John as he goes to prison. And so uh, I have pulled up all the best pictures I could from the internet of uh, people's understanding of who John the Baptist is. I always think of him as Hagrid, <laughs> if, you, if you know who Hagrid is, you know. Verse 1, now in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being governor over Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea in the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now, Luke is making sure you know exactly when this happened because all of these various people that were in power overlap at exactly the time that John the Baptist comes out. And so it's between 28 and 29 AD because it was, he was reigning for, four, for 15 years. And so now we know exactly when it was. So that's how we get this time frame and know exactly when John the Baptist came out and how old Jesus was and all of that. They were both kind of coming out at 30 years old. 30 years old uh, in rabbinic standards is basically when you start your journey. If you were going to be on the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of the Jews, you had to be 30 years old and you had to be married. So there were some requirements for folks and, uh, you know, 30 years old is kind of like another mark of manhood, if you will. You know, you have the bar mitzvah, you know, 12 and 13, you know, where you kind of declare somebody... Um, responsible to make their own decisions. And then right around 30 years old, it's like, you might have something to say by now. You've worked through all of the, you know, post adolescent years and the craziness and 30 years old, people usually kind of settle down. Have you noticed that? Except for Mark. 
<laughs> Mark has not settled down yet. But this, it's interesting because here's, here's Tiberius Caesar, and yes, that, that, is a, that is Tiberius Caesar, a likeness of Tiberius Caesar. And yes, that is a likeness of, these, these are all the people that uh, are, are up here. And notice the interesting thing, Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that there's never more than one high priest, beginning with Aaron and all the way down. What ended up happening is Rome came in and Annas was high priest, but they didn't like what Annas was doing. They couldn't control him. And so Rome installed Caiaphas and said, no, he's your high priest. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Annas and Caiaphas are high priests. One guy's a political appointee. The other guy has been selected. So that's how you have two high priests. That's how you can pinpoint exactly when this occurs on the timeline of history. So Luke, being a historian, is going to tell us the who, the what, the where, the when, the why. He's going to give us all of that in his writing. And as you look, he's very, very detailed. He's asking questions, and he's taking it all down. He's, you know, just the facts, ma'am, and he's taking them all down. We know of all of these men that their reputation for corruption was terrible, but God was doing something. It's kind of like this drum roll before God rolls out the, the red carpet, who is John the Baptist, whom Jesus then comes in after. After 400 years of silence from the book of Malachi until this moment, and darkness has been allowed to reign, and these folks have the worst reputation, and Israel is subjugated and is ruled by the Romans brutally sometimes. In the middle of all this, God speaks. And I don't know where you are, but in the middle of all your mess, God will speak to you. I want to give you some hope today because the scripture is full of it. You can have hope that God will speak to you when everything seems dark and dismal. So the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John, 30 years old, the Lord comes and speaks to him and says, this is what I want you to do. And John kind of reinvents this whole washing situation. The priests would wash ceremonially so that they would be able to serve. Those who were Gentiles, who were converted over to Judaism, would have to do a ceremonial washing. But the Jews would never have to do a washing. The people never did because they somewhat rested on their heritage. They rested on the fact that they were related to Abraham and that they had the law of Moses. And so they kind of rested in that. They didn't need to be baptized. So somebody coming with this ministry of baptism was fresh and new, and John kind of reinvented it. So he steps on the scene out from the wilderness with this great idea. I'm going to start baptizing people. And, you know, you and I understand what baptism is because... You know, we're, we're, we're now here in the, 20, in the 20s of the years. And so now we understand what it is. But all these years of silence, God finally speaks. And from darkness and despair to the light of hope in an instant. God just cut through after 400 years where Malachi is the last word we have. Suddenly he speaks to John. And John is the last of the prophets, by the way. He's not the first of something else. He's actually the last. He's the period at the end of the Old Testament. And that's why the flavor of everything that he says sounds very much Old Testament-y, if that's a word. I don't think it is. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. These are the last words of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So the last word we had from the Old Testament is curse, which is how the, the Old Testament ends. Isn't it amazing? It's Father's Day, and this is actually the scripture. It says that he will turn the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. That's one of the ministries, actually, of John the Baptist. It just so happened that we landed on it today. I want to caution all of you, never run unless you're sent. 
Now, John's been waiting since his birth to kind of come out with his ministry. God finally speaks to him and out he comes. Be careful that you don't run with something that you think is a good idea or that you think would be a wonderful idea if God hasn't called you. I can't imagine how horrible and terrible it would be for you guys to sit there and have to listen to me if the Spirit of God did not fill me with the right things to say. And I realize that. And I realize if I was here on my own and if I was sent on my own and if I climbed the, the spiritual ladder to become the pastor here or arm wrestled somebody out of it, which would be more likely. I would feel bad for you guys. Just be careful that what you do, you do because the Lord told you to do it and not because you think it's a bright idea. Only run when God sends you. Verse three, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of our God. That's in Isaiah 40 verses three and five. So Luke identifies him as the one that Isaiah speaks of. He's this voice in the wilderness that says, hey guys, you better straighten up and fly right. That's the Jersey version. Get your act together and stop messing around with stuff you shouldn't be messing around with and get ready because the Lord's coming back. Guess what? You have the same exact ministry as John the Baptist. Did you know that? Because Jesus is coming back. And people better get their act together because when he comes back, they don't want to be found with their hand in a cookie jar, so to speak. That's our ministry as well. It's not just John the Baptist who has this ministry. So he went into the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. Now you and I, when we go down into baptism, we're identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a baptism of repentance. It's not, you know, I've been a bad boy. I'm going to, you know, stop being bad and I'm going to turn my face toward the Lord and I'm going to straighten up and fly right. That's not what it is. What it is, is it's a token and it's, I am going to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ with his death, his burial and his resurrection. And I'm going to live a new life because I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. So this baptism of John kind of morphs into what we have today, which is a bit deeper and uh, much more of a token than it was, I think, for these folks but he's preaching repentance for the remission of sins. Repentance is not penance. There are some people think, well, if I stop doing bad things, I start doing good things, that'll wash away all my bad things. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you need to be ready because Jesus is coming <laughs> and you better be ready for him because he's not going to mess around. And he's not going to play games. That's the Jersey version too. Sorry. So he says, repentance. The question is, is there forgiveness without repentance? Is there a relationship with God that you have that is evidenced by non-repentance in your life? You see, the book of John tells us, if you're in Christ Jesus, you can no longer continue to sin because God's spirit lives in you. You can't. You can't continue doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Repentance is a sign that you're saved. Repentance is granted by God, by the way. It's not something you muster up and you say, oh, I'm just going to beat myself silly so that I don't do that thing again. How many of you do that? Sheepishly, a few of you do. Good. Well, I do it as well. I forget my keys and I'm like, jerk. <laughs> I call myself names. It's, it's just as ineffective as if I hit myself. I remember one child when he was very frustrated and angry with himself would bang his head on the ground. Bam, bam, bam. It's my son. I had to tell him, don't do that. I love this head. 
Anyway, <laughs> repentance is what God calls us to do, and it's the remission of our sins or, or uh, the, the, the leaving of our sins that we need to do. It's written in this book that he would be crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. We don't understand what that's like. If you had a dignitary that was coming to town, like if uh, President Biden was going to meander through here, you know that there's going to be people that go through and make sure that, you know, all the high perches don't have gunmen on them. And, you know, we, we would do that kind of thing. But here what they would do is we go through and take care of the roads, remove debris. If there were crooked sections that, that got in the road, if there was water that worn away, they would fill it in. If there were hills and mounds, sometimes they would uh, excavate that and make it nice and flat so that the king or whatever the dignitary is would be able to come in smoothly. They would even repair people's houses, the, you know, weed whackers, I imagine. They get out there and clean everything up so when the king comes through, he's pleased with what he sees, instead of saying, you know, what the heck is that shack over there? Get, get rid of them. Burn, them. burn them to the ground. You know, there are people that do that. So he's saying this voice is any, anything that's an obstacle between you and doing something the Lord wants, you need to remove that. Anything that's a pitfall that you continually fall into, you need to fill that in so it's not an issue anymore. If there's crookedness, if there's something that's not straight the way the Lord would have it, you need to straighten that out. You see, that's his message, is get your act together because the Lord's coming. You got that, right? Amen. Okay. And it's interesting, in John 1, we're given some other background from another writer. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, G, uh, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we're given some more of the story from the other gospel writers, and I'm so glad for this, because it's called Beth Bara. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but uh, it's, it's also called Bethany. This is a place at the Jordan. Beth Bara means place of crossing, which might ring a bell with you. This is the place where Joshua took the people of Israel and went over the Jordan into the promised land. And when they were done, because God performed a miracle there and drying it up, they took 12 stones and they stacked them up in the middle of the creek or in the middle of the Jordan. And they put 12 stones up on the bank so there would be a memorial. I always want to go back there and see if they're still there, but... They put these 12 stones there as a memorial to remember what happened. Kind of a, uh, you know, when, when you walk by and people say, your children go, what, what do these stones mean? In, in the old King James, what mean these stones? <laughs> I have several versions going on. So what mean these stones? And then what you do is you, that's an opportunity for you to tell them the story of how God delivered his people from bondage into freedom and into the promised land. This is where John is announcing freedom from sin. This is where he's waiting for the other Joshua, Yeshua, who is Jesus. Because Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua or Yeshua. I find it very interesting that Jesus comes to be baptized in the same place where Joshua, the first Joshua, goes over. So it's in Beth Bara or Bethany. Well, that adds some interesting... Um, background to what John's about to say. Uh, by the way, he's preaching repentance, which is a change of mind resulting in a change of action. It's metanoia. There's actually four different words that are used for repentance. Uh, metanoia is to change your mind. And it's usually in hindsight, right? You go, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, you do something, you go, oh, that was so wrong. I never should have done that. You know, like turning on the hose before you put the nozzle on it. It's, you know. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have done that. So that's a change of mind, which then will have a change of action. Next time you go to touch that nozzle, you're like, let me check the end of the hose. <laughs> that's what repentance is. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. And that's what he's telling people we sh that we should do. James chapter 2, verses 17 and 26, I paired them together. <laughs> Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He says, if you claim to be a Christian and you don't live like a Christian, then you have no right to say you are a Christian. Your behavior dictates what you believe. None of you would be sitting if you didn't believe the chair would hold you. 
but you've placed your full weight in the chair. Anybody who happens to be standing up hasn't exercised such faith. Like Steve Loy, they're sneaking in. <laughs> For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. In other words, that kind of faith can't save you if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in some mental ascent that he was a historical figure, and that's it. And you haven't trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins, and you haven't given your life to him, then that's not real faith, and it's certainly not going to produce anything in your life. And I don't know about you, but I've been on the other side of the fence before as a Christian, trying to clean up, trying to, I remember trying to stop drugs, trying to sleep around, not sleep around anymore, or try to, you know, behave myself, and it got worse. Because little did I know, I was filling up the emptiness of my soul with these things. And then stopping these things, I was just walking around empty. And then, you know, you can only hold off so long and then you binge. Any of you have been on a diet? I mean, the only real good diet's a pizza diet. Because, you know, you can always have pizza. There's a, that's the diet for me. I don't eat pizza, so... I get off all the time. Faith without works is dead. Hey, I'm on a diet, but I'll eat that pizza. It's one or the other, man. It's one or the other. You're either on a diet or you're not on a diet. Well, I'm just kind of cutting. A, you, 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 all right, whatever. You, you rationalize all you want. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to me. And then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers. Hey, John, I want you to get into a ministry. I want you to go and baptize people for the remission of their sins. And they show up and he goes, brood of vipers, who warned you? Like, what, was this a secret meeting and we weren't supposed to know about it? Or, or do you really want us to come here? Or, you know, is this his way of testing them to see if they were serious? Do you guys ever ask like serious questions of the scripture when you read stuff like this? Or you just wait for me to be totally crazy. I mean, brood of vipers. If I said that to you guys coming in today, happy Father's Day, you brood of vipers, you know. Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's got some hard words for these people, right? Well, it's interesting because Luke doesn't tell you his express audience here, but Matthew does. In Matthew 3, 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So Luke doesn't give you the target audience of who he was talking to. But we get it from Matthew. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, these people who have come to judge him and see who is this guy making all this stuff, you know, making all these words. I mean, who does he think he is? We don't even know this guy. Oh yeah, he's the son of Zechariah. As the son of Zechariah, you remember what Zechariah's job was? He was a priest. And so when you're a son of a priest, you know what you do? You're a priest. That's what you did. And here he is out in the wilderness without a haircut, eating bugs. You know, I always picture him speaking, you know, with like a little leg hanging out in his, in his beard. <laughs> That's who he was. He didn't give a rip what you thought about him. He looked like Elijah. He spoke like Elijah. In fact, he was the Elijah that was to come. And Jesus says that himself. But here he is saying, you brood of vipers. And he's trying to get their attention. And he says, don't rest in the fact that Abraham is your father and you're the children of Abraham because God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Now it makes sense. These stones, you mean the 12 stones that are piled up there that are representative of every tribe of Israel. Isn't that cool? I, 
I just find out these little things in the scripture and I just, that is so cool. These stones, God can raise children. And he says that the ax is laid at the root of the trees. In other words, it's, it's all coming down. Jesus is going to come and he's going to just level everything. And it's interesting because n not maybe um, 37 years or so after Jesus is crucified, the temple is leveled. Mm -hmm. And Judaism, as far as they knew it, is done. There's no more sacrifice. There's no more temple. There's no more uh, going to Jerusalem because there's, what do you go in there for? You bring a lamb. There's nowhere to sacrifice it. It basically was leveled. And so the ax is already at the root of the tree. I don't know about you, but there's going to be a time when you die. And when I die. And the ax is going to be laid at the root of my tree. What, what do you want to leave? What do you want to leave here? I think John had something. Because he didn't care what anybody said. He wasn't politically correct. He wasn't a people pleaser. He wasn't running for a political office, obviously. But he spoke the truth, and he, he just, right between the eyes. People that were hypocritical, he'd knock them down. But the people who asked questions, he would answer their questions. You know what a wonderful thing it is when somebody comes up and asks you, like, a real question? Not like reporters talking to the president. <laughs> Mr. President, you said this thing about Putin. I don't know if you've been watching that, but people are just beating this poor old guy up. But when somebody asks an authentic question, that's great. When somebody asks a loaded question or something where they put things in, and so he's cracking off on these brood of vipers because of their heart, not necessarily because of them asking a question. And boasting of your moral superiority because of your ancestors is as ineffective as blaming them for your failures. I'll give you a minute to think about that. To say, listen, Abraham's our father. We're in. We got the golden ticket. We're going to heaven. That's just as foolish as saying everything that's wrong with you is a result of bad parenting. If you're broken in any way, it's not your fault. All of your bad choices had nothing to do with you. It was those parents of yours. They handed down the DNA. I mean, I have a, I have a, a thirst to kill people because that, that's who I was born to, was two sinner parents. I mean, so that's what they were doing, is they're taking pride in that they're a descendant of Abraham. But how do you take pride in that? It doesn't matter if you came over to the Mayflower, boys and girls. You're going to have to stand before God and give an account for what you do in the body. And God knows every single thing. I might not, you, no one else might know, but God knows. And we're going to have to give an account before the Lord for all those things. So what do you do? I don't know about you, but I have accepted God's offer of leniency through Jesus Christ. Because of his sacrifice and his death on the cross, the perfect man died on the cross so that I don't have to suffer eternally in a fire. And so the only ax that's going to be laid to the root of my tree is my physical life, my spiritual life. I have eternal life. And so do you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's nothing that you've done except one thing. You believed that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? So the people are now asking John, what do we do? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. So his advice is, if you want to show that God has truly done something in your heart, and you want to demonstrate that, give stuff away. Give stuff away. How many of you got too much stuff? Give the stuff away. Give it away. You want to show that you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? Find somebody that needs the thing that you have that you got an extra of. I don't know about you, but I had like four compound miter saws. Listen, I did a job for somebody, and they thanked me by giving me tools because they had no money. So that's how I got one. Uh, there was another one because it's a certain kind. I had it with four. How many do you take to the job site? That's just one. That's right. But then I walk through stores and I go, wow, there's a new one. 
has got one of those little laser guides in it, you know. Well, I, I don't have room anymore for anything. So if, I ha if I'm going to buy something new, I need to get rid of something first to make room for it. Because there's no room. That's it. I mean, we're not hoarders, but we just don't have room. <laughs> Reasonably, you know, where you put something away in its place. There's just no, no room anymore. So uh, give it away. He says, listen, if you've really given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're really saved, then you don't care about the stuff and you're going to show it by how loose you are with it and how you give it away. Not only that, you're deliberately trying to find people that have needs so you can fill their needs with what you have. What a blessing that is, by the way. Do you know what a blessing that is? To give your stuff away and somebody's like, oh, thank you so much. And you're like, never meant that much to me. It certainly means a lot to you. But see, that's cool, right? Yes. I don't know about you, but I bought a bunch of food for today. And I got really excited about it. Because it's Father's Day. I get to determine the menu. <laughs> so what we have today is meat. <laughs> and meat. And some other meat. <laughs> I have lamb. I have pork. I have burgers for those people. We have six hot dogs, probably, for the grandchildren. We have steak. We have ribs. Party at Dave's house. <laughs> but see, I get to determine the menu, but the blessing is you get to buy stuff that you know other people enjoy. What a blessing it is. Man, I'm going to be man and a girl. It doesn't matter what you said, Eunice. I'm going to be working. Eunice told me, you don't have to do anything today. <laughs> and I, don't, don't, don't you know what I do? <laughs> and Rocco got sick. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot today. And I'm going to be manning the girl. So, and if you want to drop by, drop by. 121 Broad Street. Just for you to let you know. <laughs> but giving is such a blessing. And he says, listen, if, if God has done a work in your heart, then you're going to demonstrate that by how you behave. By giving. So what should we do? Give. You don't have to be stingy. You don't have to hold on because God will provide for you, right? If you know him, then you know this is true. But then the tax collectors came up to be baptized and he said to them, teacher, what shall we do? And they said to him, collect no more than what is appointed to you. Well, that makes sense. Now, tax collectors were very notorious thieves. They basically were Jews, many of them, because they have contacts with the people that were bought by the Romans. And they basically, like Matthew was, or Levi, he basically just turned in his heritage to be the enemy of those people and to work for the Romans. But you see, they had an X amount that they had to collect, and anything over that, they got to put in their pocket. So if Rome says 10% tax on everybody, you go door to door, you knock on the door, and you collect 10% tax of whatever you assess, if you tell them, no, 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 it's 15%, it went up, then this is the, po this is the pocket for Rome, and this is my pocket. And very often, these folks were incredibly rich. They, they uncovered a statue of a tax collector recently near Jerusalem. And the reason it's such an amazing thing is the, 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 the engraving on it talks about how they found one honest tax collector. And it was such a big deal, they made a statue for him because <laughs> it's just so rare. So the tax collectors are saying, what about us? What do we have to do? And he says, don't collect anything more than what, what you do. And what a blessing that is when you find somebody that's not willing to take more than, than what's due, right? I mean, that's a blessing. It's a blessing to find somebody that's honest. I mean, I, I, I was at a store, and this lady gave me the wrong amount of change. And I walked away, and I was like, uh, that ain't right. I said, you, you gave me too much, and I figured it out. And she was like, like she turned white instantly, like that, I just almost lost my job. I think it was like a $20 bill. It, was, it wasn't chump change. But, and there was a guy, and he's like, wow. <laughs> like, really? Like, I got wrong change. She made a mistake, and she's going to suffer for it. And you think I'm doing a big thing by giving it back? It's not even mine. When God doesn't work in your heart, you're not like, stupid idiot, I'm keeping this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> because the Lord's done a work in your heart and you wouldn't want that done to you. So they say, 
he says to him, don't take any more than what's owed to you. And then the soldiers, now there were soldiers there to be baptized. These, these guys want to give their life over to God and do what God wants them to. Likewise, the soldiers asked him saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Notice they have three things they need to do because the one to whom much is given, much is required. You know, when you're in a position of authority, you can misuse that authority and you can use it to intimidate people. In fact, there are all sorts of books if you go to uh, Barnes and Noble that will train you to be aggressive in business. And what you need to do is learn how to intimidate, manipulate. Mm -hmm. And humility is nowhere on the scale as far as this world's concerned. And so he says, don't forcibly put your power on anybody. Don't do it. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. Why would you accuse them falsely? Because you want to make some money. Hey, you just sold that. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. <laughs> Pull the sword out. Yes, you did. Okay, okay, maybe I did. Give it to me and we'll just forget about it. <laughs> and then they walk away. And that's the way the world works. Trust me, I was a contractor. The guys that come and look at your house and make sure it's uh, approved. Many of them are like this. Yeah, I don't know. Looks like you got some problems. Yeah, I might have to fail you. That'll put you back. Unchecked authority is a bad thing. That's why I have elders. Because I could just... Anyway. So what should we do? Don't intimidate anyone. Don't falsely accuse. And be content with your wages. Wow, not even one moan. Be content with your wages. Well, he said it to soldiers, so it doesn't really apply to us, does it? Um, being content. Do you know what contentment is? It's saying, God takes care of me, and if I don't have a certain thing, I probably don't need it. I, I don't have a new iPhone. So what? My phone works. I pick it up. I talk to people. I can FaceTime. GPS works. It's, what do I need a new phone for? Well, battery's going to go at some point. But <laughs> bottom line, why can't we be content? If God has truly done a work in your life, contentment is going to be part of who you are. You know, somebody crashes your car and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And you're like, don't worry about it. I'll get another one. I got insurance. I mean, it's mandatory in New Jersey you have insurance. I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> I'll bet you're dead. So... What's the big deal? So you get a new car. Listen, I'll never get a new car unless my old one wears out. I, at this point, I'm hoping my compound miter saw will break sometime in the near future, and I'll get a new one. That's the only way you can get something new is if, you know. So be content with your wages. Contentment is something that only is found when we're in Christ. And when we're not, you got to wonder why not. Am I looking for my life to come from the stuff I have? Am I looking for my worth in how much I'm paid? Men, when we retire, the problem is you're on a fixed income and you feel like you're only worth this much. People are worth way more than whatever they get paid. Everyone. The soul is way more important. That was the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fan will be in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. There's fire again. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. So he says, There's, you, you guys think I'm all that and a bag of chips, and I'm not. So not only did he tell them what they needed to do, but he told them who he's not. And he didn't become the fixture. He didn't become the center of attention. He pointed people, he pointed people to the Messiah who would come. 
And he says, there's somebody coming who I'm not even worthy to go down on his dirty shoes and take off the crusty laces off of his ankle to wash his feet. I can't even do the first part. I'm not even worthy enough to take his shoe off. And that was like the lowest position in a house to wash somebody's feet. And you would give it to the lowest slave or the youngest child that you could force to do it. He says, that's where I am. So he had a true understanding of his humility. So here he's speaking with fire, but he also understands that he's, he's a zero as far as, you know, being somebody compared to Jesus. But Herod the Tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, he shut John up in prison. So we're given kind of a fast forward as to what happens with John. John, in the courts of Herod, gets in his face and tells him, this woman that you're sleeping with is not your wife. That's your brother's wife. And you got no right being with her. That made him very uncomfortable. But he didn't want to do anything. And when the other gospels tell us, he didn't want to do anything because the people knew he was a prophet and he was afraid that there would be a revolt. So he didn't want to kill John, but he wanted to kill John. But Herodias was something else. She had a young daughter. She pushes her to, the, to dance in front of Herod, who's a lust king. And he says, I'll, I'll give you anything you want. He watched her you know, do this dance and he got all hot and bothered. And he says, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Just say it. And she said, I'll take John's head on a platter for a hundred dollars, please. And he felt sorry that he had said that because then he actually had to do it. He was in front of all of his guests. And so he puts John in prison. I want you to know something. The ministry of John lasted for a year. His imprisonment lasted for two before they finally took his head off. Do you think of that as, wow, 30 years old, bing, God speaks to him. He gets busy. He's out there telling people he's baptized. All these people are coming out and getting baptized. People are asking questions. He's able to teach them and show them what repentance looks like. And then he's arrested. Only a year into his ministry. He thought Jesus got cut down early in his three or three and a half years of ministry. One year of ministry, two years in prison, and then off with his head. What if it were you? What if you had one year left? What if you knew? This time next year, you'll be gone. Would it change the way you live? Would you occupy your day with the things you're going to occupy your day with, or your week, or your month? These are questions I ask myself in the quiet. Sometimes I tell you about it. Will you regret the truth that you have told or that which you have withheld. You know, there's nobody at the end of their life says, you know, I wish I worked more. <laughs> there's nobody. No, the regrets at the end of our lives are things, bad decisions that we made, willfulness, unforgiveness, bitterness, people we've hurt, all of those things, the devil comes around and begins to rehearse them in your ears. And of all the wasted time, you know, how many, how many episodes of senseless TV shows have I memorized being a child and I could have used that time. And don't you wish you could get all that wasted time back? Well, John only had a year. And you know what? I think he left it all in the field. I think he did it all. In Matthew 11, 11, Jesus speaking of John the Baptist says, assuredly, I say to you among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John the Baptist but he was least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, the greatest prophet that ever lived was John the Baptist, as far as Jesus is concerned. But every single one of you here in this place have an opportunity to do better than him. Isn't that interesting? So the best hasn't been had yet. So 
Jesus says he's the greatest. Muhammad Ali said he was the greatest. Who are you going to believe? <laughs> Next week, we're going to pick it up in verse 21. And all the people were baptized. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and in you I am well pleased. But we'll pick that up next week.